All right. So um, I guess I'm going to be speaking for something like five hours today or four hours, long time. So um, I'm going to structure it in a somewhat chronological fashion, which reflects to some extent my personal journey in this field of privacy and privacy technologies. Um, and I'll start by talking about things in privacy that are very popular and don't work, and we'll try to explain why they don't work, and then try to outline some directions for the future and maybe offer some hope that something could be done um, in this field. But uh, at least for the first hour or so, let me talk about what's happening out there with your personal data and why we seem to have a pretty serious problem. You're being watched. And I don't even mean the government, even though it's an important issue. You're being watched even by organizations that do not have law enforcement powers or surveillance powers like governments do. In particular, anything you do online and even offline, the clicks you make on websites, things you buy, um, various things you say online, are being recorded often by multiple entities. Uh, the reason this is happening is because this is actually a significant source of money for a lot of companies. So you can see the names of some very prominent companies on this slide. And the reason these companies are so successful to a large extent is because they're able to collect very fine-grained information about their users' behavior and monetize it in various ways. And we're talking about people's preferences and purchases they make and opinions they express. But at the end of the day, one of the reasons uh, these companies are so powerful is because they actually are able to track people's behavior and preferences at a very fine level of granularity and make money using that information. So they have access to vast data sets of information. Uh, these companies are obviously social networks, and this is yet another area where this information about people's relationships with each other and uh, how they interact with each other is extremely valuable. So there are lots of companies on this slide, some of them bigger than others. Uh, to the extent they make money, they make money by m monetizing information about their users and what we would normally consider personal information. Um, interestingly, this is not just about commercial transactions and preferences and social interactions and so on. Even in medical sphere, and this is kind of a, an interesting case because typically the data that these companies deal with is immutable. So those are things like, for example, genetic data sets that cannot even be changed or masked. So it's not like, it's not at all like uh, uh, personal behavior. So there are a lot of companies that try to collect fine-grained genetic and biomedical and clinical information about healthy people, about sick people. There are social networks for various people with diseases and so on, and they try to monetize it in various ways. So this is yet another aspect of data collection that's going on. And these companies, and these names are much less recognizable, but uh, actually they are no less important than the ones that you have heard about. These companies, they tend to operate somewhat invisibly to the end user, and what they specialize in is third-party tracking. So uh, when you visit some website, they try to capture your behavior on these websites, all the clicks you make, uh, how you move from website to website, and the purpose is to try to monetize it, typically by showing targeted advertising, but in the process of doing this targeted advertising, they tend to collect very fine-grained and detailed data sets that can track pretty much the entire path that you take as you go from website to website, as you perform web searches, as you click on links on one website and go to another website. You leave a website, you return to it several days later, so that information is being collected. Uh, and what is this is also accompanied by is what I'll call aggregation, and a very interesting aspect of it is combining online information and offline information. So there are companies, and these are pretty substantial businesses, making millions, and in some cases dozens and hundreds of millions of dollars, 
by taking information about online behavior, whether we're talking uh, kind of browsing behavior and going from website to website, but also information about purchases and express preferences and so on, and trying to match it to offline databases. Um, uh, civil records, property ownership records, financial records, definitely things like mortgages, credit cards, stuff like this, trying to create these massive databases that really capture pretty much the entire behavior of individuals, um, uh, both online and offline. And obviously, this seems to raise certain privacy issues because these companies are not um, governments, uh, they are not uh, subject to the normal democratic process, obviously, because there's a for-profit enterprises. Um, they're also usually not regulated. There are relatively few constraints on their ability to collect this information. And it seems a little bit disturbing that even though no single company at the moment has the ultimate database, somehow a lot of them have this huge chunks of um, uh, detailed personal information about hundreds of millions of people, or in some cases is getting close to billions of people, um, uh, that they possess and they tr use in various ways, they share with each other and so on. So, and since a lot of this information seems fairly sensitive from a privacy perspective, there is kind of a natural question here, so w what about privacy? And when you talk to these guys and when you listen to these guys, because obviously, you know, it's lots of people are concerned about privacy, they always have the same answer uh, to the question about privacy. And uh, as far as they're concerned, this just answers all concerns you might have. And that's uh, the data is anonymized. So yes, they have information about everyone and it's detailed information, but they don't know who you are. Or maybe they know who you are, but when they share this information with their partners or try to make money off of it, all information about individuals in there is removed. So their solution is anonymity or anonymization. And you see it again and again. You see companies they, in their marketing materials, when they pitch themselves to investors, when they try to explain themselves to users, they always emphasize the information is anonymous. Uh, so this is the former chief privacy officer of Facebook testifying before Congress, drawing the distinction between sharing information in personal identifiable form and sharing of information in non-personal identifiable form. And this is where we encounter what I would call um, uh, the uh, philosopher's stone of privacy, and that is the distinction that information exists in two forms. There is the bad form, personal identifiable form, unsafe form. But just like medieval alchemists, they believe that there is some uh, magic substance called the philosopher's stone that you can uh, use to convert a base metal into a noble metal. So they believe that you can take like lead or something useless, turn it into gold. In the same way, there is a belief here that you can take this data that exists in an unsafe form, personal identifiable form with information about people, and then you can apply some magic transformation to it, some philosopher's stone, something, you know, some abracadabra, and then that turns into a non-personal identifiable form, and at that, uh, at that point information is anonymized, uh, you cannot reattach it to individuals from whom this information came, and at this point it's safe to publish, it's safe to share, it's safe to uh, make money off, to release to partners, do whatever you want with it. And um, at least for the first part of my talk, I will try to drill into this distinction between information in personal identifiable form and so-called non-personal identifiable form. And in particular, I'll try to argue that by and large, this distinction is fallacious, that it's very hard to tell what's personal identifiable, what's not personal identifiable. And in many cases, even information that has been de-identified and scrubbed and sanitized uh, uh, using the best known methodologies, still retains enough on it that it could be re-identified and um, result in privacy violations. So, but um, this notion of non-personal identifiable information is really pervasive as far as 
uh, privacy technologies today are concerned and certainly as far as what people are practicing out there in the real world. So, um, for example, if you do a Google search for we do not collect personal identifiable information, you come up with several dozen uh, million results. So this is really a very pervasive notion. So any company it could be uh, watching you 24-7 collecting everything about your life, but then when you ask them, oh, what about my privacy, they tell you, oh, don't worry about it. We do not keep it in a personal identifiable form. So yeah, that's a lot. And this number actually, I've been giving this talk for a couple of years now, and this number has been growing. Like every time I give the talk, this, this number goes up by some factor. Okay. So um, let's talk about one particular way of sharing data, and that's uh, so-called privacy-preserving data release. So this is typically happens when companies either publish data or share data with partners. So the way it usually works, and details vary from company to company, so I'll just try to kind of give a high-level picture here. But the way it typically works, we start with some data set, and it could be, in some cases, it's a uh, government data set like census data or it could be some health data set obtained as a result of some clinical study or in some cases some corporations are very interested in releasing this data for various purposes so they have a data set and then they apply some transformation to it and they use different names for it and there are like I said details vary sometimes they call it anonymization sometimes they call it de-identification sanitization perturbation various things and at that point the data becomes good, okay? So personal identifiable information is removed, it turns into this very nice, non-personal identifiable form, and at this point, ah, you know, you can share it, you can publish it, because, you know, you have achieved privacy uh, by performing this magical transformation. Um, actually, uh, before I go into what, why this might not work, let me mention that one reaction that I sometimes get from computer scientists when I talk about it is the following. They say, look, um, yeah, there is a problem, but at the end of the day, it's an access control problem. So everyone uh, owns their, their data and they should control their data. So why don't we apply some known access control mechanisms and associate them with data and make it, uh, uh, will make it easier to share in a safe way? And I, I know where these people are coming from. It's because, you know, access control is a very well understood notion. Computer scientists have been working on access control for years and years. But in, in lots of cases, um, in the case of um, personal information, access control is really not the right notion. It has its place, but in many cases it just isn't. Like for example, in social networks, uh, information about social relationship is shared. So one end point of a relationship might, might consider it private, the other might not. Uh, in biomedical information, especially in genetic information, it's clear that access control just cannot be applied out of the box because uh, genetic information is obviously shared with all blood relatives and it's uh, well known by now that huge chunks of your genetic information could be reconstructed by having access to various points in the genealogy tree uh, close to you, which means that even if you exercise perfect access control over your genetic data and don't give it to anyone, there are other people possibly related to you who could disclose their information and that would allow reconstruction of yours. That doesn't work. And as I will be showing during the second part of my talk, in some cases, even if no information is released, just by observing various aspects of the system and how they change over time, it is possible to infer what this protected information is. So this is looking ahead a little bit, but I'm just going to mention right away that this simplistic notion of imposing access control on the data and ensure that all individuals own their data and make decisions with whom to share it might not be directly applicable here. All right, so um, we live in this world of um, massive information collection and sharing, but if you listen to people who do this, it's all nice and safe because information is only shared and published in non-personal identifiable form. Nevertheless, um, somehow every couple of years or so, we seem to have a major privacy disaster, some privacy issue that makes the news. And I have been involved in some of this, so I have some uh, battle scars to show. Uh, but um, it's kind of interesting to understand why do this keep happening? So you might remember the AOL search data scandal when 
Uh, AOL uh, released a bunch of anonymized um, search logs of AOL users, and they were uh, promptly used by some New York Times reporter to find, to identify one of the users. Um, Actually, this is kind of interesting how it was identified because the data, like I said, was anonymized, uh, but uh, you could see all searches belonging to a particular user even though the user was anonymous. And some reporter looking through it just noticed, looking at the content of the searches, there were no IP addresses, no identities, he noticed that there is a user who is uh, uh, looking for a particular last name that seems relatively uncommon, looking for businesses in a little town called Lilburn, Georgia, um, uh, seem to be looking for dating sites for older people and uh, uh, what to do with the dog that pees on everything. So he went to the phone book for this little town, Lilburn, Georgia, and uh, searched for this uh, last name and found there were uh, five or six, I, I don't remember the exact number of people with that last name. And uh, then he just uh, called up some of them and eventually found uh, an older lady who was indeed that particular AOL user. And she said, oh yeah, yeah, it's me. I'm kind of lonely and I do have a dog that pees on everything. And if you know kind of a nice older gentleman, please let him know that I'm available. Um, so this is an example of how just having information where Every particular s search that she was performing wasn't necessarily identifying because, you know, there are something like, I forget, five, ten thousand people living in Lilburn, and obviously lots of people have a problem with the dog that urinates everywhere, but uh, enough of this taken in combination, you uniquely identify an individual. And in a few minutes, I'll try to give you kind of very, um, well, a more rigorous algorithmic sense in which this is true. Um, there, has, there have been a lot of uh, these privacy disasters in the area of biomedical information. Uh, I'll touch very briefly on this later, but a few years ago, the National Institute of Health ha in the U.S. had to remove several very important genetic data sets uh, from uh, public websites and effectively set back um, biomedical research because somebody has shown that it is possible to actually identify people present in this data set by performing some analysis. Um, so this uh, target scandal uh, was earlier this year. Uh, this is, um, I'll, again, I'll mention it briefly because this is really presenting a very big, the issue that arises there is a very big challenge for privacy research and privacy technologists. Um, so, I'll talk about it a little bit now and a little bit later, but this is something for which we do not actually have any solution now. So the issue is this. So um, Target, like most companies uh, that I mentioned, the reason they collect these massive data sets about their customers and their customers' behavior is so that they can perform large-scale data mining and find patterns in the data that um, allow them to identify what the customer might be buying next. One of the patterns that targets data mining identified is that people who buy uh, a certain set of products uh, first tend to be female and second they tend to be pregnant. Okay, that's not surprising. Pregnant people probably buy a certain set of products. And then, based on that, their advertising department or marketing department starts sending marketing information to these people, um, you know, telling them, oh, you know, you have a baby on the way, we have all these wonderful products at Target that you can buy. So what happened in this case is that it identified one of its customers as uh, being pregnant, started sending that pregnancy uh, information to her house. Well, it turned out that this was a teenage girl. Her parents were not aware that she was pregnant, and all of a sudden she started getting this uh, information and promotions from Target for people with a baby on the way, and that was kind of an unpleasant way for her dad to find out that his daughter is pregnant. So, I mean, it's not technically speaking a privacy violation because, you know, she was a Target customer and Target was sending information to her customer. No information was actually being shared except uh, between Target and Target's customer. But um, as you'll see later on with some minor modification, you can see how this, I mean, the presence of this massive data mining algorithms that find patterns in the data uh, 
and uh, 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 craft advertising and marketing based on this, uh, how this can actually lead to very serious privacy breaches completely unintentionally just because the data mining algorithm can figure out something about a person and this data mining algorithm is becoming, becoming pretty darn good without actually anybody understanding that that's happening. It's just purely algorithms chugging along and then they end up inferring something and then they create marketing messages based on that, and it turns out that they accidentally identify something sensitive about an individual that that individual might not want other people to know. So anyway, so these things keep happening. So, and a reasonable question to ask, so why do they keep happening? Why do we, in spite of all this, techniques that people use, anonymization, de-identification, removal of personal identifiable information, why do we keep encountering these uh, privacy disasters in the news every couple of years or so? Um, and I would argue that the main problem, the root cause of all of these privacy violations, is that even when, the even when companies and, in general, data holders try to anonymize the data by removing what they call PII, or personal identifiable information, this notion of PI really has no technical meaning. What they tend to do, they go by these laundry lists of things that they need to remove, names obviously, things like social security numbers, emails, addresses, stuff like this. But the real issue is that, as you'll see in privacy breaches, pretty much any information can be personally identifying. And what's even more disturbing, even if a particular piece of information by itself is not personal identifying, a small combination of these pieces, even though one single piece is not identifying, a combination is. And since you, it's very hard to predict what combination might be available um, uh, given external sources of information and so on and so forth, effectively this notion of PII, which is even defined in some laws and so on, really has no technical meaning, that pretty much anything could be used for re-identification. So um, there have been a number of papers uh, about this in the past few years. So I'm only going to talk about a couple uh, in this talk, but I do want to mention a few in case you want to find out more about this. Uh, there was a very famous paper about 15 years ago by Latanya Sweeney, where she showed, and this was an extremely influential result, that she could take a fully anonymized uh, hospital discharge database, uh, so it was anonymized that as names were removed, but it retained some demographic information like postal codes and date of birth and gender. Obviously, none of this is identifying by itself. And then she took the database and combined it with a, a list of registered voters. So, so this was the hospital discharge database from Massachusetts hospitals. She combined it with a list of registered voters in Massachusetts. And these lists are obviously public by law to, pr to make sure that, there is, uh, that it's not full of uh, fake uh, voters. And uh, ha she just did a join on two databases and saw what's in the join. And that allowed her to identify records of many people, including the person who was then the governor of Massachusetts, because it turns out that even though uh, zip code alone is not identifying, date of birth is not identifying, and gender obviously is not identifying. The three together actually identify a significant fraction of the population. So by correlating them, it's uh, easy to do. So, so this was a very influential piece of research, and um, uh, it was maybe one of the very first kind of more academic papers on de-anonymization, uh, showing how it can be done. Um, I will talk about research I did with my former student Arvind Narayanan on uh, re-identifying the Netflix price data set. So I'll talk more about that and kind of in general trying to give an algorithmic foundation to uh, the identification. But this research actually, uh, this general area of research continued uh, and there have been some very interesting results in the past few years. So I just want to highlight one, which is even not a computer science paper. It's from, from a completely different community. But uh, that's the paper that caused the National Institute of Health uh, to remove um, their genetic data sets from public access, which showed that you can um, identify, uh, even if you have uh, completely anonymized genetic, sequence, uh, uh, genetic sequences, you can um, identify uh, 
uh, whether a particular person is present in the data set. And there was even follow-up to that work that showed even an even stronger result that even if you have statistics published from uh, a biomedical study that is not mm, uh, not just um, sequences, just some high level correlations and so on, there is enough information there that you can just use the statistics to identify if a particular person is present in, uh, in the genetic data set, which really kind of uh, drove um, uh, the final nail into the coffin of privacy of genetic data. So, let's try to understand at a more rigorous algorithmic level, how might denonymization work and why it works and why it's a, it's a generic problem, why it's not specific to a particular data set, why, it's tr why these things keep happening, why it's true for so many data sets that they're easily re-identifiable. If I had to summarize concisely what it is that makes anonymization so hard, and the reverse side of this makes re-identification possible, the answer would be the curse of dimensionality, which is a very well-known problem in data analysis. And it always arises when you have, a data, when you have databases or data sets um, with high dimensions. So, so what do I mean by this? So let's imagine, for now, that we have access to a completely anonymized, let's imagine, data set of users of some service, where uh, users would be in rows and the columns would, would correspond to items they bought or preferences they expressed, uh, uh, whether they did something or not. And typically in data sets that capture real human behavior, the number of columns and therefore the number of dimensions is immense. So for example, in the case of uh, Netflix price data set that I'm going to be talking about in a few minutes. Um, there are something like 35,000 movies in this data set and for every user and every movie you can see did they watch it or not and how they rated it and when they rated it. But uh, in the simplest case whether they watched it or not that gives you kind of a bit, one or zero. Um, but if you, if, if you had access to Amazon's data set, which we fortunately don't, but um, you can imagine Amazon's data set, this table is huge because for every item Amazon possibly sells, um, we're talking dozens of uh, millions possibly, uh, including Amazon Marketplace, in every column we have, did the user buy it or not, did they rate it or not, when they did it and so on. But the bottom line is that if the number of users could be measured in thousands or dozens, dozens of thousands or millions, but the number of columns could go up into dozens of millions and we can view each point in this data, every record, we can view a point in this multi-dimensional space where dimensions are defined by the items that are available. And here is the thing about multi-dimensional data sets is, and this is really the key, kind of mathematically this is the key to why anonymization is so difficult and why the identification is typically a, a loser's game in this space, is that the number of dimensions is so high is that an average record has n no similar record. So you'll see in a moment why this is very relevant for privacy. But this, is, this phenomenon, and it's somewhat related to what's known as a long tail, uh, that is that people um, tend to buy things that are kind of towards the tail end of the distribution of popularity, but never mind that. So this, this, is, the, this is really the, the, the key slide for this part of the talk, that for an average record, if you try to look for someone in the data set who looks even a little bit similar, you're not going to find anything. So this is, for example, in the Netflix price data set, which is a data set. Um, so these are records of 500,000 users of the Netflix movie rental service that was released a few years ago in support of the data mining competition. So if you just ignore the ratings, so it contained like how these people rated various movies and so on, just considering whether a user watched the movie or not, okay? So uh, you look at every user, did he watch a movie or not? So that gives you kind of a bit vector of length 35,000 bits. So considering just movie names, for 90% of records, there isn't a single other record in the data set which is more than 30% similar. So what, I, what I'm trying to say is that if you look at each user record uh, as a point in this space, 
you try to say, are there any other users who are close to it, who are similar to that users? And the answer is no. For the vast majority of them, you have to go pretty far to find, user, to find a user uh, who is even a little bit similar. So why is, why is this important for privacy? So any, any guesses from the room? The people who are still awake, yeah? If you don't have somebody to look by, you won't be able to have that person uh, appear as you do or maybe add some uncertainty to you. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Is that the whole point of privacy is to make my record look like somebody else's record. But if we're so far apart from this space, it's, it becomes impossible. Effectively, you have to destroy the record to make it similar to someone else. You wouldn't be able to integrate databases and link anonymized records to say that the person who has kids is the one that buys cars. Because you need the similarity in some dimensions to say that this is that one. In some dimensions, exactly. But, but a lot of data mining, they try to find correlations between two dimensions. Okay? So people who have kids buy cars, or they buy car seats, and so on. But they typically look only at a small number of dimensions. Whereas here, to protect anonymity, you have to anonymize it in all dimensions, because a consequence of the sparsity is that even having access to a few random points in a few dimensions, so even if I have access only to a small part of the user record, typically there would be a unique record in the data set to which it maps. And that's the whole basis of the re-identification and anonymization work, uh, de-anonymization work that I'll be talking about. So this is really, so, uh, so I haven't gone to de-anonymization algorithms just yet, but this is really the key empirical fact about the data that we're dealing with here that makes anonymization so difficult. And that's what underlies all the privacy breaches that we talked about. Um, just to give you a concrete example, for example, an AOL search data set, you can think of every search term as a dimension. And obviously, since these are natural language search terms, the number of dimensions at this point is measured in like billions, which means that even having access to a few points uniquely identifies a person. Okay, you know, dog, Lilburn, older man, uh, particular last name that immediately, even though it's only four dimensions out of billions, that immediately pins it down. Now, what kind of privacy threats are we concerned about? Well, you know, I'm not going to be specific here, but all of these have something in common. Whether we're talking global surveillance by the men or the government, or we're talking about abusive marketing or phishing or just kind of things that people are concerned about, like nosy co-workers and employers and insurance discrimination. What all of this have in common is that they typically have some information about the person uh, whom... Um, so they're looking for information about a person, and they already know a little bit about that person. And this little bit that they already know I'll call it auxiliary information, so that's a technical term. But think of it, um, sometimes it's called background knowledge or external knowledge. But this is some information that's available to the adversary outside of the normal data release process. So to set up the problem of re-identification and the problem of uh, de-anonymization properly, the question I'm going to ask is this. So suppose we have an anonymized data set, so there are no... Uh, Identities, all personal identifiable information has been removed, but it is, uh, it has this form of kind of a big table uh, with a large number of columns, large number of dimensions. And then the question I'm going to ask, what can the adversary learn by um, taking this anonymized data set and taking a little bit of information about one or more individuals that he already knows, that I'll refer to as auxiliary information, uh, what can be learned by combining them together? And I'll try to convince you that the answer is a lot can be learned. Um, so in general, that's the shape of this area or the basic approach in this area. So we start with some data set uh, capturing a real world behavior. We're talking movie ratings, purchases, what have you. Uh, these data sets are inevitably sparse, as I try to argue, and this is an empirical fact. It's very unusual to find a high-dimensional data set of human behavior that's not sparse. Um, then we're going to try to be creative and imaginative in looking for sources of auxiliary information, so we can try uh, 
uh, voting lists, we can try social networks, we can collect information in various ways. So this is where you can let your imagination run wild. And then what we'll try to do is see if this auxiliary information uh, available to us, these external sources of information, public databases and so on, could be used to pin down uh, particular points in this anonymized data set and to be able to say, yes, this is the person uh, uh, I'm looking for. So that's how re-identification will succeed. And again, sparsity will come to our rescue here because it'll turn out that this data set is so sparse uh, that even a little bit of auxiliary information is enough to either uniquely identify a person or to find a cluster of points. And maybe you cannot uniquely identify a person in there, but they all have something in common. So you can infer that. I don't know which of these points is the person I'm looking for, but they all have some feature in common. They all have the same political affiliation. They all have the same sexual orientation. They all, I don't know, go to the same place. And then you can infer uh, things about people even if you cannot identify them. This is actually very important because often defenses against re-identification and anonymization technique, they try to ensure that you cannot find a specific record in the data set. But our goal here is not even find a specific record. It's great if we can, but in general, we want to learn as much uh, about the record as possible. And in some cases, uh, even if we cannot identify the right record, uh, we can learn a lot about it. And this is a problem that a lot of kind of naive definition of anonymity, including a particular um, definition that was very popular a few years ago and seems to be fortunately going out of fashion now called k-anonymity, which says that, oh, uh, you should not be, you know, a data set is anonymized if you have um, uh, k copies of every attribute. I'm not saying it precisely, but that's kind of roughly the idea. Um, and it turns out that that by itself does not prevent anyone from learning things about, about records because you can find a cluster of K, but they all have some attribute in common and then you can infer things. So th it's important to keep in mind that even though ideally we would achieve re-identification, sometimes even if you cannot pin a particular record, just finding a cluster with some similarities is going to be enough. Of course, this, pro um, so, uh, uh, this process of denimization uh, my goal is to develop some pretty robust algorithms for doing this, uh, but it's a challenging process because we're trying to do it with real data sets. So these are not some manufactured artifacts. These are real things that are available to us. Um, and auxiliary information, we have to work with what we have. Um, in particular, this auxiliary information is noisy. Uh, there is no guarantee that information contained in other external source of information completely matches what's in the anonymized data because there could have been some perturbation applied during the release or there could be mistakes uh, in both. So standard kind of information retrieval matching techniques don't work. In some cases, actually in most cases, nobody releases their entire data sets only a sample has been released. So you have to deal with the fact that um, you um, uh, that it's possible that the person you're looking for is not even in the data set. So you have to be able to tell if that's the case. Uh, and somehow you have to argue that you're not getting false matches because in many cases you do not have an oracle to confirm your success. You do not have ground truth. So how do you know that your identification has actually been correct if nobody's telling you, okay, you win. So it turns out that developing these algorithms is a little harder than it might seem. Just, uh, you know, you just look at sparsity and you think, oh, of course it works. But uh, that's kind of the theory, but getting it to work in practice is a little more challenging. So, and in general, you, a useful way to think about it, if you're a little more mathematically inclined, is to think of this auxiliary information as a noisy projection of the real record. So you have a real record of the user, uh, which is present in the anonymized data set. You have information available to the adversary, which contains a few points from the, a few dimensions from the real record, but maybe not exactly. Maybe it contains some things that are not in the real record, and maybe it contains some things from the real record, but modified in a certain way. Uh, and so the goal is how, given this very small, noisy projection of the actual record, how to map it back uh, to the real record. Um, so let me um, make sure um, that we're on the same page and explain what denimization is not. 
So it is not purely linkage. So in uh, things like statistics and releases of census data, people looked at linkage of records. This is not what's happening here because, t for example, uh, when people release, you know, uh, web searches or uh, movie rating data or purchases data, it's not possible to directly link that record with um, exactly the same record uh, elsewhere. Um, it's not search, it's not information retrieval because you need robustness to noise. Typically, the way information retrieval works, think about doing like a Google search, okay? It's very important what keywords you put in. Like if you put in a particular keyword, especially a rare keyword, uh, or not put it, your search results will change dramatically depending on whether that keyword is in there or not. Uh, this is not the case here. You have to be robust to the fact that some of the information you're, uh, that's present in your auxiliary information could be completely spurious and has nothing to do with what you're looking for. Um, it's not classification, it's not machine learning. There is a deep connection between what we're doing in dynamization and in machine learning that I'll tie, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about it in much detail, but it's in some sense, it's that kind of mirror image of machine learning. So machine learning tries to find things that are characteristic of fairly large sets of people, of groups of people, whereas we're trying to find the opposite. We're trying to find what's characteristic of individuals. And it's not exactly the same as uh, fingerprinting individuals, um, although it's related to that. So it's kind of, you know, its own little area. Although we do use techniques from uh, uh, all of this. Um, the general pattern for algorithms and again, this is not an algorithm, this is more like a template for an algorithm, is what we'll call a scoreboard. And the idea is this. So uh, it has two parts. It has the scoring part and the record selection. So given an auxiliary information, we go through each anonymized record in the release data set and try to rank it or assign a score to it based on uh, how well it matches the aux. And there are different similarities uh, metrics we can find. But here is an interesting trick. So we typically scale this similarity by the inverse of the logarithm of matching information. So what, what, what that, that sounded like a mouthful there. So intuitively, when we match, we try to give higher weights to rare attributes, okay? So the idea being is that this weight, you can think of it as a measure of entropy or as, uh, or as a measure of uniqueness. So the idea here is that if there is something uh, very, uh, there is an attribute that doesn't occur all that often, it's much more important to match on those attributes. So for example, in case of uh, movies, we'll see that rarer movies, so you know, everybody watched Star Wars, so that's not particularly helpful for, um, finding uh, people in the movie rating data set. But if you see somebody liking a relatively obscure movie that has much more weight in terms of identi identifying things, or for example, with AOL searches, you see something like Lilburn, okay, that's, that's pretty good. But if you see a match on a particular last name, and that's a rare last name, you give much higher weight to the fact that you match on that than if you match on a relatively more common attribute. And then for record selection, uh, to separate true and spurious matches, because effectively you have lots of possible candidates and lots of different scores, there is a particular trick that we uh, came up with to separate true and spurious matches that I will be talking about. And this uh, turns out to be a very versatile kind of template for algorithms, very versatile paradigm that we um, successfully managed to apply to lots of different kinds of data sets. Um, of course, a natural general question is how much auxiliary information do you need uh, in order for this to succeed? And under very mild assumptions about sparsity of the data set, you roughly need a logarithmic um, amount of information. Uh, in practice, actually, it'll turn out that you need much less, but if you try to prove a general theorem about how much information you need, um, very little. And again, that's because of sparsity. That's because people are so far apart from each other that given only a logarithmic fraction of a person's record, you can, on average, uniquely identify that record. And even if you don't have even that, even if not enough auxiliary information is available, that's still okay because very often you can, you can not uniquely identify 
a record, but you can find a cluster of records that have something in common. It reveals a lot of information. You can refer, infer things about individuals. So let me now talk a little bit concretely about one of the early works we did on this um, about uh, five, six or seven years ago. And this was on de-anonymizing uh, or showing, or rather showing the feasibility of de-anonymization and re-identification of the Netflix Prize dataset. So the Netflix Prize dataset, so this was released by Netflix uh, back in 2006 to support a data mining competition they ran. Um, then they tried to do a second one a few years ago, but that got canceled by the Federal Trade Commission, kind of came down hard on them. So I was a little bit involved in that. Uh, but anyway, so the f in the first data set, they released a snippet of their data set, uh, completely anonymized uh, for 500,000 users. Um, so even though the entire Netflix data set contains 35,000 movies, they only released ratings for 18,000 movies. Uh, because this was for data mining competitions, so they wanted people to develop algorithms that based on the available information could predict uh, better than Netflix's um, algorithm at the time, which movies the person is going to like or not. So, um, all right. So, on average, uh, this release data set contained 213 dated users, uh, dated, sorry, dated ratings uh, per user on average. And it turns out that knowing only two of those, that's how sparse the data set, knowing only two random uh, data ratings is enough to reduce to approximately eight candidate records, and knowing four is enough to identify a record uniquely. So think about it. So that's, that's really a very concrete and tangible illustration of sparsity in this data set. So an average user has 200 ratings, so you'd think like, oh boy, I mean, there is a lot of overlap between users. Well, yes and no. On every individual movie, yes, there is a huge overlap because every individual movie uh, has been watched by lots of people. But once you, once you take only four of them together with dates, that's actually enough to pin down, on average, a record uniquely. Meaning that just four out of 200 ensures that there are no neighbors re remaining, you uniquely pin down a record. And that's just taking things on random. If you focus on more obscure stuff, things outside, Top 100 movies, top 10,000 movies, it works even better. So once you go into the tail, like obscure movies are even better for identifying. Even though, like make no mistake, it's not like you see this movie and there is only one person in the data set that watched that movie. That's not true. You see one obscure movie and there are dozens of thousands of people in the data set who watched it. But you take two and again there are thousands, but the overlap between them on average is like one person or two people. Okay? So because of that, that's, um, again, I can only reiterate that it comes from sparsity of this data, from the absence of nearest neighbors, from, and that, that what means that if you project, even a small projection is enough to uniquely identify a point in this space. So this, is, this effect is really, can be observed here in a very powerful form. Um, we're often asked uh, when we worked on this, and I, I mean, it's been a few years, so this, this work is a little dated, as in there are much better techniques now, but when we worked on it, people often asked us, oh, well, how do you know that you identified the person correctly? So, all right, so you found some source of auxiliary information, and at the time we used um, Internet Movie Database, but um, of course, if we were doing this today, we would be using social networks to find information uh, about movies that people watched and use that to find their records in the Netflix data set. But, you know, we don't have ground truth. So when identification, how do we know? Okay, so our algorithm says this is a match, okay? So this person from the Internet Movie Database, that's his record in the Netflix data set. These are all the movies they watched, whether they liked it or not. How do you know that it's true? So how do you know that this match is not spurious? in the absence of the ground truth, because Netflix was certainly not telling us uh, that we identify things correctly. Um, you know, they were telling us various things, none of them nice, but uh, certainly that did not include telling us uh, that we identify things correctly. So this is where we came up with this heuristic, uh, which we call eccentricity, which actually works pretty well, not just in this case. I'll show you in a moment how it works on social networks with even greater success. So, and 
remember, like the point of this algorithm is that we compute a score for each record, how well it matches the auxiliary information that we have. And then we look at the following heuristic. We look at the difference between best matching record and second best matching record. So given a auxiliary information for some individuals, we go through the whole data set and we look for each record in the data set, we give a score how well it matches the aux. And we look at the gap between the best score and the second best score. And this turns out to work great for identifying spurious matches. So if you look at this, so if we give, if we create, in this case, artificial auxiliary information. So we take a record that we know is in the data set, take a small projection, and then run our algorithm, try to find the record back given this projection. The gap between the best score and the second best score is huge. And if we try to give it an uh, aux of a record that's not in the data set, this gap tends to be small. So this big gap between the best match and the second best match, and I mean, of course, there is a question, what's big, what's small, but I'm just trying to communicate a general idea. So this gap, what we call eccentricity, that is how distinct the best matches from all other matches, turns out to be a very powerful tool for eliminating spurious matches. And we later tried it on a bunch of data sets where we do have ground truth and it just works very well. I mean, it is possible that even for the true match, the gap here is small. Okay, so this is just for eliminating false matches. You could be losing some true matches by applying this. So, but generally we're more concerned about false positives. Yeah. What type of uh, auxiliary information do you need in, in this case, for example? So, so this is, uh, okay, so uh, auxiliary information, um, so, uh, so, sorry. So what we need, to, what we used for this experiment so for this experiment, we took a record that's already in the data set and created artificial auxiliary information. That is, we took a record in the data set, we created a small projection, and then said, this projection is our auxiliary information. Let's try to find that record ba back in the data set. Okay? So in this case, the auxiliary information wasn't real, as in, like, it was created from the data set itself. I, d does this make sense? Uh, yeah. But, but, but even in cases where we have ground truth, we tried it with auxiliary information that's true auxiliary information that doesn't come from the data set itself, that comes from some external source. And we observe exactly the same effect there. Okay, so um, there is another way you can measure this. So uh, after we find a match, we can remove, it, we can remove the record we found, found and try to run the algorithm again. And overwhelmingly, when this happens, now the algorithm tells us that the record is no longer in the data set. So this is kind of another way of saying the same thing, that the matches are not spurious. Um, and also what's important is that this algorithm, this matching, again, because of the sparsity in the data set, is so robust to errors in attacker's auxiliary information that it can even tolerate a lot of noise. So dates and ratings may be known imprecisely, some may be completely wrong, the data might be perturbed a little bit. The nearest neighbor in the sparse data sets are so far, these points are so sparse in these data sets that uh, even if you have a very noisy things and some things are wrong and you try to do matching, still, if it's there, you find it. So basically with six approximately correct and two completely wrong ratings, even if your aux contains fallacious information about movies that the person did not rate, did not even watch, you can recover almost on all entropy. That is, either you identify uniquely or you find a small group of people containing the correct match. Again, it's not surprising given uh, how sparse it is, but you know, it's, uh, it's good that it works in practice. So what are the main uh, themes um, that I've been talking about so far? Um, kind of uh, try to take a little pause here before I talk about social networks. So some of them, um, some takeaway lessons from this, some are conceptual, some are method methodological. So conceptual lessons, and this, these are the things, you know, especially things on the left uh, that I want you to remember uh, from, from this part of the talk is that these data sets that we're talking about containing personal information, 
they are very sparse. No nearest neighbors, people are very far from each other and so on. Uh, the amount of auxiliary information that you need to identify a record is, or uh, information available from other sources that you need to identify a record is very small, typically logarithmic in the number of records, linear in noise. Because of this, the distinction between what's personally identifiable and non-personally identifiable is unclear, okay? Meaning that it doesn't matter, like effectively what this tells you is that any information about a person, once you have enough of it, and enough is very small, logarithmic, in the size of the person's record, any subset of attributes can be personally identifying. So that's, that's pretty powerful because it tells you that people who are trying to anonymize this data are really facing a very tall order here, okay? Because they have to anonymize every, subset, every little subset of the person's attributes and in the case of uh, these data sets, we're talking possibly of millions of attributes, and that becomes algorithmically impossible. And again, I mean, this is not new. This is just the curse of dimensionality, very well known in data analysis. Here it kind of rears its ugly head again. Um, and because of that, anything is personally identifiable. Any combination of attributes, uh, any small combination of attributes is effectively can be used to re-identify the record and act as personal identifiable information. Um, and also, even if you don't have uh, individual data, and that's what I'll be talking about after the break, even if you only have aggregate data, even in that case, you can often infer information about individuals, although the techniques there are more sophisticated. Then there are certain methodological points um, that are specific to our algorithms because uh, you know, one of, the th one of the things we try to do is to try to develop an algorithmic toolkit uh, that allows other people to do re-identification and so on. Uh, this idea of a scoring function, so matching similarity between information you know about an individual and an anonymized record, uh, scoring function in particular that gives higher weight to uh, rare attributes, the idea of self-testing to avoid self-matches and eccentricity. Uh, then there is kind of a very interesting idea of self-correction or iterative re-identification. And I will be actually talking about this in the context of social networks, which I'll be talking about for the next half hour or so. And this point, the distinction between aggregate and individual data, and how even if you don't have um, individual data, you only have statistical aggregates, how even that could be used to go back to inputs, uh, I'll be talking about after the break. Okay, so now let me talk a little bit about how similar techniques can be applied to a more sophisticated setting, uh, more structured data, but also more complex data, and that's social networks. So before, uh, what I showed you, the only thing we did was exploit sparsity of the data. Since it's such a fundamental feature of the data, characteristic of all data sets, so this first set of algorithms, they only targeted sparsity. Now, for the next half hour or so, I will try to give you another set of algorithms that exploits structure of the data in addition to sparsity. And this work was also done in collaboration with Arvind Narayanan, who was my former student and now is a faculty member uh, at Princeton doing his own research. Um, again, some reading material in case you want to read more about this. Uh, the first paper um, that actually showed the feasibility of structural, of exploiting um, data structure, in particular graph structure for denimization, uh, actually came from uh, Cornell and Microsoft Research, from Lars uh, Backstrom and Cynthia Dwork and John Kleinberg. Uh, so they had a paper in Dub 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 uh, 2007, but if you want to read it, I recommend the CACM version of it, um, where they showed how it can be done. Then we had our paper with Arvind in Auckland a few years back, um, and the, the techniques that we developed in um, Auckland were used with even greater success. This is a very nice paper that I actually had nothing to do with, but I will mention it because it's such a nice paper uh, by Arvind and a few collaborators um, on uh, where they use this uh, social network re-identification techniques to win uh, a data mining challenge. So I'll talk about this in a few minutes. So, social networks. 
So every time I talk about social networks, uh, I show this graph. So why do I show this graph uh, or this uh, social graph? Well, because usually when I say social networks, people think, ah, it's something silly, you know, I know, Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, who cares? This is a very different kind of social network. This is real data taken from uh, a sociology paper, uh, from a published sociology paper, and it contains uh, the sexual network of a, a Midwestern high school uh, in the United States. And I hope you believe me that this data is much more sensitive than, you know, something silly like Twitter, you know, uh, lots of things are interesting here. Uh, the presence of a giant connected component, the presence of triangles in this graph, okay? So you can see there's a male and female. So lots of sensitive information. So when I say social networks, think this social graph, because that's actually, you know, very sensitive information here, and you better hope that it could be anonymized in a meaningful way or else we're all in trouble. But it's not just this. Things like phone call graphs, which we know now, for example, the U.S. government is collecting with abandon because they believe uh, they're very useful for identifying, uh, who the hell knows what they're identifying, but they believe it's useful. Um, but it's not just governments, okay? So, well, governments, you know, it's an important topic, but what can I do about the government? You know, they, you know, they have kind of powers that normal companies don't have. But even commercial companies, there are something like 3,000 companies providing wireless services in the U.S. For the most part, they do not have the expertise to analyze their phone call graphs. So what they do is they hire consultants, they hire third-party services to analyze their graphs. They sell them, they share it with other people. Whenever they show them, oh, you know, it's anonymized. I'm only giving you the graph and so on. So, so phone call graphs is another example of a social graph that's important from a privacy perspective. And, of course, you know, the usual online social networks, the Twitters and MySpaces of the work. So here is what we'll try to do here. So uh, we'll try to solve the problem that um, I'll call structural denimization. And if before uh, we were looking at, I have a data set of records, uh, and then I try to match auxiliary information to it, here it's the same problem, but in a slightly different setting. I have two graphs. One graph is completely anonymized. So all identities have been removed. All attributes have been removed. All contextual information have been removed. I have pure topology, just nodes and edges, nothing else. Actually, in practice, you usually have more information, but I, I'm going to make things hard for myself. So you only have... Uh, bare graph, and on the other hand, you have a graph uh, where you do have identities and everything, but it's a graph that, it's a different graph. So you know that there is some overlap between the two. For example, one is a Facebook graph, the other is an anonymized phone, phone call graph. Or one graph uh, is one social network and it has been anonymized, the other one is another social network. So they don't match one to one because a bunch of people are in one graph but not in the other graph. Some people are in both graphs but, you know, their relationship are not exactly the same. So you know there is an overlap, but this overlap is not perfect. So you're not going to be able to do like graph isomorphism, okay? So because these graphs are, not, are definitely not isomorphic. And by the way, if you're thinking like graph isomorphism is very hard, yeah, but like kind of hard instances of graph isomorphism do not arise in those graphs. But anyway, it doesn't matter because this is not gra graph isomorphism anyhow. So what I want to do is construct some kind of structural mapping. And what's going to help here is um, two-stage way of going about it, and this is really not my contribution. This is, this is Arvind, my former student, who worked on this uh, for years and kind of uh, got it to a stage where it really works very successfully and has been proven on many kinds of graphs, especially uh, graphs of online social networks, trying to do this matching in two ways. Uh, I'm sorry, in two steps. The first step is uh, what we call seed matching, where you use detailed knowledge about a small number of nodes to try to create an initial small mapping. And by small, I mean a few dozen nodes. You map them to each other. And then you kind of turn the crank and you go into the propagation stage where this existing seed mapping is being augmented. So using that as the seed, you construct 
more links, and then you use the new mapping as the seed for the next stage. And you run it in several stages, and this is really beautiful. When it works, it's, it's, it's a sight to behold. It's, it's like a spread of an epidemic. It's, it works better the more you do this, and it's self-reinforcing, okay? So this is why it's so important to not think of identification, uh, sorry, re-identification as kind of a one-shot deal. So effectively, you uh, do it once, and then you use the output of this as auxiliary information for the next stage. You get a bigger auxiliary information, you use that as auxiliary information for the next stage, and then it kind of grows virally, and then all of a sudden you turn the crank and bang, 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 it identifies like a huge chunk of the graph starting from a small number of nodes. So it's really beautiful when it works. So let me go a little bit into technical details here. So, but in order for this, to get, for this to get going, you need to start with seed matching. So where to start? So, and remember, we have two graphs um, uh, which we know there is an overlap, uh, but we don't know, you know where it is or how big it is and so on. So, okay, so a few ideas come to mind how we might go about this. Uh, but the one that turned out to be very productive in practice is looking at the highest in degree nodes. Okay? So, and by the way, typically these are directed graphs, um, but you can think of them as directed or undirected depending on what they are. But it turns out that starting with the highest in degree nodes and matching them to each other is a very useful way of identifying uh, seed mappings. Now, That's right, but that's true for social graphs. I mean, these are not artificially generated graphs. That's, you're absolutely right. And that's, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, sparsity, this is, this is this big hammer that, you know, I'm going to whack everything with, at least for this part of the talk. Um, so, so what do, how do you match them? Uh, how do you match the seeds to each other? So, well, some ideas come to mind. You can match them based on degree. But there is too much variation in it. Um, that tends not to work very well because, uh, you know, even if it's the same person in one graph, they, you know, uh, like Facebook graph, typically like much denser than a phone call graph. So just looking at degrees, uh, there is just too much variation. Subgraph structure, kind of topological matching between subgraph structure, um, that could be too sparse. Um, so, and again, this is, this is kind of not exactly science. This is kind of art and black magic. We tried a bunch of things over months and years and eventually came up with some things that worked and then Arvin tried it again on his own and he came up with things that worked even better. So the thing that turns out to work very well is the number of common neighbors between each pair of nodes. That turns out to be a very good heuristic for constructing this initial seed mapping. And then it turns out um, and this is actually described very well in this um, last paper that I mentioned on winning the Kaggle social network challenge, is uh, you can turn this into a combinatorial optimization problem and use, uh, effectively this reduces to a known problem, weighted graph matching, and you can use techniques like simulated annealing to do this, to construct the mapping between seed nodes, okay? So these are technical details that I'm kind of, uh, I'm not describing them, I'm mainly advertising them. So those of you who are interested in technical details can go and read the paper. But uh, the important takeaway lesson from this is that as far as finding the initial mapping of uh, a few nodes between uh, the graphs, uh, it's enough uh, to focus on common number of common neighbors as the metric and then use standard algorithms for solving weighted graph matching. And then, yeah. All the seeds exist in both graphs because if you said earlier that you're not sure that all of the nodes exist, so it's possible That's that right. the high degree nodes are also. Yeah, yeah. It'll find some that exist in both graphs. It'll just find a few. You only need a handful, okay? So on some it'll fail, some it won't find, some of them might even be spurious, okay? As long as it empirically kind of finds a few of them, you're good, okay? And uh, all right, so, but so far you haven't solved anything. You, you just found a few mappings and so on. And now the, the beautiful part starts. I guess both are pretty good, but uh, the part that I really like because it's kind of visually so nice, you do this iterative propagation. So you have this seed mapping that maybe maps a few nodes. 
And then you turn the crank and you ask, okay, so how do, how do, um, how do I use this? Well, you know, you could look at this intuitively and say, well, uh, see this green node in the, kind of in the middle there? So what do you think it might be mapping to? The blue node up there, right? See like how it's connected to uh, three nodes here and three nodes there? So it's connected to them in this graph and it's connected to them in that graph. You know what, maybe that's the same node. So you might try and kind of establish a mapping here. And you can do the same here and there. And then, so you run it once and it gives you this mapping, but then you kind of continue running it. You effectively repeat this process and so on. And you're going to make mistakes. And actually in getting this to work, uh, there is a lot of kind of heuristics that go into this and so on. But hopefully you get the idea how using what you already constructed, you look at common neighbors and, and you run it. So how do you measure similarity? Again, there are many ways to do this, but given already mapped nodes, so you have some candidate nodes on the left here, and you want to know how they map to auxiliary nodes in the target. Uh, sorry, how auxiliary nodes on the right map to the target nodes on the left. Well, let's see. So uh, how do we measure it? Let's, let's look at this one on the left and look at that one on the right. Okay, so maybe there might be a mapping between, like if you look at this column, between the second node from the top there and the second node from the top on the right. But obviously, this matching um, is not perfect, uh, right? Why is it not perfect? Because, because they don't match on all neighbors, okay? So, so if we look at this matching, we can measure like something like cosine similarity. We can see like, oh, well, it matches on two neighbors out of three. That looks pretty good. Some of them are going to match, I know, nine out of ten. That sounds like really good. So you get the idea. So you try to, to, use this, um, to use this metric. And again, look, I mean, we're working with real data here. So those graphs are what they are. And, you know, using these algorithms in practice does require some tweaking and some adjusting of parameters and so on and so forth. But, but roughly using the similarity metrics, that's how you construct new mapping. And you keep going at some point, you know, you start getting bogus results, then you might need to backtrack and so on. So sometimes people ask me, what is the complexity of this algorithm? And uh, I don't know. Uh, no, but, but it's, it's like, it's really not one algorithm. It's like sort of one template and lots of heuristics on top of that template. So, um, and the big problem there is of course dealing with noise because you have non-overlapping nodes and edges even if the same node is present, even if the same subgraph is present on both graphs. Um, they don't match perfectly because graphs evolve over time. Typically you get snapshots of this taken at different times. You know, people unfriend each other, people stop following each other. Uh, sometimes data is perturbed and so on. Sometimes there are just mistakes in data collection. And so, uh, lots of different techniques um, uh, that uh, have had to be developed in order to get this to work. Um, things like reverse mapping, so you first run it with auxiliary information, map it to the target, then you flip it, then you say, well, if this mapping is correct, then using the target as auxiliary information, I should be able to reconstruct it. If that fails, then you have a problem. Taking edge weights into account, weighing some nodes higher than others, lots of things. The one that I will focus on is eccentricity, because again, this idea, this gap between the best match and second best match, turns out to be an excellent heuristic for eliminating spurious matches. And again, typically our goal here is that it's okay to lose some true matches as long as we eliminate most of the spurious matches. And so, eccentricity here, yeah? That is most excellent. That, that is e excellent, excellent, excellent question. Excellent question. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, um, you don't get the same final mapping, no. But you get a pretty big overlap in the experiments that we tried on existing graphs, okay? So, it's reasonably stable. So, like, depending on, like, on different starting points, you tend to end up in mostly the same place, 
But remember, our starting point, I mean, you don't have a whole lot of variance. Typically, it's some subset of high in degree nodes. So it's not like you don't start from completely different places. Now, if the graph were weird, like if there were disconnected components there and things like this, of course, that would be completely different. But in most of these graphs, they look exactly like you would expect an online social network graph to look like. A giant connected component, that's effectively what you're remapping, like some big connected part in the middle of the giant connected component. But, but that's, yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, uh, we don't have any guarantees of stability. I mean, things I'm talking about here, we have algorithms, but they don't have like, you know, we cannot make any claims about their properties. And I'm sure it's easier to come up with artificial graphs where they're going to fail pretty badly. But, you know, all I can say on real graphs, they don't seem to fail. They seem to work pretty good, giving some pretty interesting results that are coming on the next slide. So, uh, so eccentricity here for eliminating spurious matches works in a very similar uh, in a very similar way. So let's say we have a bunch of candidate nodes and we have uh, possible mappings and typically for true positives, meaning that a correct match, the gap between the best matching node and the second best matching node is large. For false positives, this gap tends to be small. Okay, that's an empirical fact, but correct matches tend to stand out, meaning that you can set the eccentricity threshold that maybe you get a smaller mapping, maybe you lose some true positives, but the mapping that you do get, you can be pretty confident. And in some cases we have ground truth oracles. So I'm gonna tell you about this in a moment, where those come from. But um, typically this gap between the best match and the second best match, you can set the threshold so that the presence of this gap uh, indicates that the map is correct. So, um, so here is, uh, a very amusing example of uh, using this ground truth oracle. And again, this is not my work, this is mostly Arvin's work, um, along with um, Elaine Shi and uh, Ben Rubinstein. Um, so uh, Kaggle, which is a very interesting company out in the Silicon Valley, they run data mining competitions. And uh, a few years back, uh, they ran a competition for link prediction. So link prediction is a very important thing for all online social networks. So when they try to establish a link that should be there but isn't. So you, you can probably see it in Facebook, like when Facebook tells you, why don't you friend this person? This person seems like they're related to you. And they're like, damn, how did they know? This is my high school buddy. Like, wow, like the, the mega brain is at work. I mean, all they're doing is link prediction. They realize like, okay, so there are all the links and this link should be there, but it's not and, and the link should indeed be there. So that's link prediction. So uh, Kaggle um, designed a competition um, uh, for this. They released an anonymized social network graph and um, uh, uh, with some prizes for the best algorithm, the best program that predicts links that they didn't release but that are actually present in the graph. Makes sense, right? All right, so what um, Arvind and company did, they said, okay, that's pretty good. So we could run some clever data mining algorithm, you know, clever social network analysis algorithm to try to figure out uh, kind of based on machine learning uh, what links uh, should and shouldn't be there. We can uh, instead just uh, kind of, you know, uh, look at the uh, answer sheet. Uh, and they looked at this anonymized network and they asked the question, hmm, where could this anonymized social network could possibly come from? It obviously comes from some real network. There aren't so many of them. We're experts on de-anonymization. So let's just look at a bunch of networks that are out there and try to de-anonymize them and see which of them match the anonymous network that they released, okay? And very soon they discovered that, oh boy, this anonymized network that was released as part of this competition, this anonymized partial network, right? Because it's missing some of the links to support the contest. It actually matches very well the true social uh, network of Flickr, where people you know, can be contacts with each other and so on. That's an online photo sharing site. And at this point, link prediction becomes very easy. You just know what links are there because you know the answer. You know the real Flickr network. So they wrote a program that just looked at the links that were present in Flickr, absent from the anonymized graph, and predicted that, oh, that network has been, that, that link has to be there, and that link has to be there, and that link has to be there. They're not actually analyzing the data. They just know the link is there because they 
know where the network is coming from. And I'm told that apparently Kaggle was really amazed. Wow, this program really works amazingly. It predicts links that like no algorithm can possibly predict. Okay? And of course it predicts it because they know, they know the true answer. So effectively, so, so here the anonymization provides the, you know, if you will, an oracle for true answers, which is a really cool application of uh, uh, denimization. So um, it gave them 57% 57, 57 coverage with 98% accuracy. Okay, so that's pretty amazing accuracy for link prediction. But uh, do you know why not 100%? Any guesses? Well, there are mistakes, and also the graph changed between the time it was released. Somebody uncontacted each other and so on. So, you know, this thing really works. So this is the most concrete illustration that I know of that this, you know, uh, this is no joke. I mean, even so, in some cases, we de-anonymize, de and there is no ground truth, and then people are like, ah, this is all spurious, you have no proof. This is the proof that it works, is that when you do have ground truth, it match the results of this de algorithms match the ground truth extremely well. And apparently they won the competition, so like Kaggle as well, you know, that's not what we had in mind, but like, boy, you know, like uh, nothing in the rules of this context, uh, contest uh, says that you cannot do this. So anyway, um, but um, so this paper is kind of at the moment um, the state of the art as far as social network analysis is concerned. Uh, but um, uh, most of these papers are obviously a few years old. Since then, there have been many, many other uh, denimization results, and this has turned out to be a very active and fruitful area of research. Um, I'm personally not involved in it so much anymore. I'm mostly working on uh, more sophisticated inference algorithms, which is the topic of you know, uh, the lecture after the break, and also trying to look at privacy issues on some emerging platforms, which is what I'm going to be talking about after lunch. Um, but, uh, but people have certainly continued working in this area. Lots of work on social um, network, um, anonymization, denonymization, and so on. Location data. This is a huge, extremely sparse, extremely sensitive, uh, type of data, lots of data sets available being used in all sorts of ways. Uh, so anonymity, alleged anonymity of uh, uh, location data and how it fails is a very interesting topic, lots of papers there. Stylometry, that is writing style. So people have shown, including uh, Arvind, again working on his own and with other colleagues uh, in last year's Auckland, uh, they showed how you can identify people based on their writing style. Um, by analyzing large collection of blogs and establishing authorship of uh, writing text. Um, genetic data is also very important here, and I'm mentioning it briefly because it's a little bit of a different problem. Everything else, you know, you could unfriend everybody, you could par not participate in social networks, you can try to mask your writing style, but you cannot change your genetic data. So obviously anonymity of genetic data uh, is very important, but also it's extremely sparse, so issues there are even harder. It's the same general approach, you know, sparsity helps, structure helps, uh, the same idea of scoring based on match of um, uh, auxiliary information, giving higher weight to rare attributes, and the centricity to eliminate spurious matches. The same algorithmic ideas work there, but of course data models are different, algorithms are different, scaling challenges are different, but the basic pattern of de anonymization and reunification works. So, just um, let me spend a couple of minutes before we break trying to draw some lessons from uh, this part of my talk. So first of all, de is extremely robust. You know, um, there is only 33 bits of entropy in, human, uh, in humans. Uh, why 33 bits? Where does this number come from? Why, uh, what? Uh, no, not DNA, no. Uh, so 33 bits, uh, so this is enough to identify any human on the planet, because this is the, <laughs> what? Yeah, this is the logarithm of the population of Earth, okay? So, um, which means that, you know, 33 bits is not a lot of information. So actually, Arvind's blog is called 33 bits, <laughs> uh, where he blogs about his denimization research. So, you know, just, which means, you know, Six to eight movies, four to seven friends, just a little bit of information is enough to identify anyone. 
Um, these data sets are so sparse that uh, typically perturbing data to FOIL re-identification will destroy all utility because if you try to get people to look like each other in high dimensions, this, it's very hard to do while preserving utility. Uh, it's a very robust paradigm, so we can estimate confidence and eliminate spurious matches even without ground truth. It's very important to keep in mind that this process of de-animization and re-identification is iterative and kind of repetitive, meaning that the more you do, the better it works. You can use the output of re-identification as auxiliary information for the next stage. It's seen in very powerful form in social networks. The second lesson is, uh, my sense is that the concept of personal identifiable information is technically meaningless, even though there are laws like the HIPAA law in the US uh, that talks about, you know, tries to define PII as um, information with respect to which there is a reasonable basis to believe the information could be used to identify the individual. That's kind of legal speak. But what I've been trying to argue for the past few years is that, like I said, any information about an individual, once you have enough of it, where enough is pretty small, can be used for identification. So we wrote a CACM column about this a few years ago, kind of targeted to a more general audience, arguing that any piece of information can be identifying and giving uh, concrete examples of this. Um, and um, this, I believe, is actually having some impact on how people go about this. So now, um, if you read some uh, testimony before Federal Trade Commission and various hearings and kind of government regulatory bodies uh, where they talk about um, uh, data release practices and personal data protection, they are becoming to recognize that this distinction between personal identifiable and supposedly de-identified information is blurred and there are very few bright lines and, and rules and kind of separations between what's personal identifiable and non-personal identifiable. And every year brings more examples of um, uh, situations where uh, what was previously considered non-personal identifiable um, has in fact been used to identify individuals. So um, I think this is a good point to take a break for half an hour, I believe. And after the break, I'll talk about some more sophisticated uh, privacy analysis techniques. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before the break,